Hello, and welcome to the Movie Brightly podcast. My name's Tom. I'm here with my co-host, Blaine. Hi, Blaine. Hello. Together, we have over 32 years of combined experience in the creative industry, and it hasn't been easy. We've had to put in long hours, climb the ranks, and do the jobs nobody wanted to do, all in hopes of one day living our dreams of living creative lives, with creative careers. But you know what we discovered? Living the creative life you always wanted isn't all it's cracked up to be. Every day is full of inspiration, creative problem solving, and that can lead to burnout. This podcast explores the way in which top people in the creative industry move forward in a career they love while finding new ways to infuse creativity into their lives and work and keep that creative passion alive. Join us weekly as we have those conversations and walk away with nuggets we could all use to stave off burnout and continue to produce better and better work. And also just come hang out with us because it's going to be fun. Kevin was amazing. That was a great interview. He is such a sweet man and just so, uh, so warm and generous. So warm and generous. Yeah. Um, I think we're you gave play. me a look. You gave me a look, by the way, at the beginning when I said I had watched his season of Top Chef. Blown away. What commitment? I mean, hey. blown away. Like when I texted you his bio today, I was like, I guess we're winging it. And this is like, he'll know sort of the basic what you watched the whole thing. First of all, you're welcome because what a TV experience. But yeah, <laughs> but yeah like also, if you told me this was a job, like, oh, your job's to watch a season of Top Chef. be like, I'm fucking in heaven. I made it. <laughs> this is perfect. Now, were you a Top Chef fan prior? Is Was this your first time or? It was my first time watching a whole season. I had okay. seen episodes like like if I was scrolling cable and it was on, sure. But I never like actively paid attention to it before. So this was my first time from beginning to end watching an entire season. And I got to say, what a show. What a show. Now, I think the early days were, I mean, I would say, I think Kevin's season is the most memorable. Those memorable those Voltaggio brothers, what a storyline. And then you, I yeah. mean, and then Kevin just, you just love him. You just look at him and you just like, I love him. Yeah, he had the perfect blend on that show of confidence and humility. I think of all the contestants where he was confident in what he did. He knew what he did was good, but he never acted like, above anybody he never thought you know i deserve to win the i mean he would say things like i would be disappointed in myself if i didn't make the finals but that's just confidence and you have to be confident right yeah. to to work at such a level in something that you're doing but it, he never disparaged another competitor which there was some of that going on in that season you know between the brothers but also specifically targeted at one contestant in particular um by a lot of people and he never hopped on that bandwagon he never really had a negative thing to say about other contestants, which I really admired because I think in a competition like that, it's very easy to get petty, especially if you get, if you're frustrated in yourself or if you're frustrated in the outcome of a particular competition, I think it would be a lot of people's first instinct to go, not even go low, but to turn the focus off of your work and onto somebody else's. And he never did that. And he was just such a such just such a charming, joyful fellow. And I think that really shined through in our interview with him. Absolutely. I actually reached out to him on Instagram recently and talked about what a pivotal pi I have become unable to speak. What a pivotal moment it was for me in my own artistic journey when he did the episode and cooked the humble cabbage. And just elevated the cabbage to be the star. Now, first of all, cabbage is phenomenal. Like you get a good roast on a cabbage. It's, I would, I think it's like one of the best things. Um, it caramelized. It's just like the best. But to cook it on, on Top Chef and put it out and present it as like, this is worthy of being on the show and not even worthy, but I think this is a winner because you believe in how good cabbage is. I mean, just it it is a study 
in believing in the worth of your own taste. Mm -hmm. it just, it was, it was, I mean, I'll never forget it. Clearly, it's made a mark on you, even though you're day drunk right now and can barely speak. I think I mean, it's pretty what obvious. What has that... happened between finishing the episode and now? And I don't know. Like, you went down to the tequila. kitchen. Yeah, stuck a couple <laughs> hidden behind your third screen on your setup right now. Just like a big bottle of Tito's or something like that. Oh, just a little audience peek behind the curtain. Uh, when we just finished the episode, I was concerned that I had lost the recording. And I think I also lost my mind. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, a little bit. Uh, yeah. <laughs> all, but it's all good. It's all, all there. Function. Being able I to mean, talk. to anybody listening to this, you know it's fine because you just listened to the episode. So it's you know fine. it's all good. It's yeah, fine. But it's fine. so magical. Now, you're the audience listening to this before you hear the interview, and I just have to say, you know, buckle up. Kevin, welcome to the Move Me Brightly podcast. This has been a long time in the making, and we're so happy to have you. I'm happy to be here. Thanks for inviting me. Of course. Are you are you still in Maine? I am. Yep. So this is our little tiny cottage in Maine. So hence, you know, everything is kind of in one little tiny little spot, but I love it for that reason. That's so great. Um, I've really been admiring your photography whilst in Maine. You're doing a great job. <laughs> Thank you. That's, that is the product of, of this supercomputer that I carry around in my pocket. Um, and just, you know, a, a decent, like a pseudo knowledge of how to use editing software, like nothing good just just enough to get myself in trouble so well the the farm stand that you photographed the other day i was like is that are we in a magazine what have that, you what have you done that place was just so perfectly styled and i searched social media for hours trying to find it because i wanted to tag them but they're not there like so despite the fact that it looks like it's built for instagram they clearly have no desire to have that so they just it's just the creative outlet of somebody who wants to do it. And, and that's one of the things I love about Maine is that these, you know, people hear me say farm stand and they think I just mean like a place to buy eggs on the side of the road. And sometimes that is the case, but they're the most like weirdly curated little micro businesses. And I think they're beautiful. I mean, and isn't that, that's the entire purpose of this podcast, just finding different ways to be creative when you're a creative person. And I think we all or I'm hoping that we all experience some degree of burnout. That's the the whole thesis for the podcast. So starting a farm why would you, stand. Why would you hope that? <laughs> and like to my... prove your hypothesis correct, <laughs> yeah. basically. <laughs> I yes. hope we all get really sad. <laughs> being burnout is not necessarily being sad. It true. could just that's be true. a product of, you know, success. I think that absolutely is the case. I mean, I was having this conversation this morning that I refer to it as drowning in success, that there is a, that is a real thing. You know, to, everybody thinks that success just implies positivity all the time, but it can also imply a serious struggle, um, it, whether that's a struggle to stay quote unquote successful or that, that you just don't know what to do once you get it. So I, I will pay a compliment to you. I have interviewed 150 people. And you are the only person who I looked up on Wikipedia and listened to a prior podcast you were on. Wow. I mean, that I, I that's truly me showing my respect to you because my main thing is I'm just going to wing it. And it's landed me in some trouble sometimes. But earlier today, I was listening to you on a podcast where you were discussing body positivity. Mm -hmm. And I heard you talk about being so driven before you were diagnosed with cancer that these awards would come in. I, I'm assuming James Beard nominations and you just tossed aside and like kept moving forward. And that is, it's, I think it sounds mentally like that's a James Beard award. What's he doing? But I know exactly what you're talking about. Yeah, it's it's really it's hard to articulate to people because um they they wouldn't understand that. They just don't they don't get the almost neuroses that I found myself in where I was where I was clearly trying to validate something about myself and 
the the rub, you know, the secret was that there would never be anything. Like that was it. And that's the part that's so hard for people to understand is that there was no award. There was no version of success that was truly going to fix the real problem, which at its root was that I didn't believe it about myself. And until I started to embrace the fact that, um, you know, that I was worthwhile, that I had valid sort of, uh, you know, validity, just being who I was and that I didn't have to, didn't have to prove it. Um, weirdly enough, like I, you know, I could have won a Nobel prize and it wouldn't have mattered to me. I would have been like, oh, that's neat. Like, and then woken up the next day, still just as frustrated as before. You would have had the money from a Nobel prize, which would help. I'm I sure. didn't know that came with money, but yeah. now I'm much <laughs> more interested. <laughs> well, that, that that's interesting that you say that about the James Beard nominations, because those came after your initial appearance on Top Chef, right? Well, most did. So most did. The, the very first one, I actually think might be the reason I even ended up on Top Chef in the first place. I received a nomination for Rising Star when I was 24 years old. Wow. And, um, and then shortly thereafter, I started getting calls from Top Chef. And I had never seen Top Chef. I didn't know what it was. I kind of vaguely remembered the name a little bit, but it didn't mean anything to me it's only like many years later that I've kind of asked myself, how in the world did they even find me? And that, my guess is that's probably how it came about. Right. So the research I did for this episode was watch that entire season of Top Chef Las Vegas <laughs> over the last week, which I, like you, I had never seen, I had seen episodes of Top Chef, but I had never watched the full season before. In my head, I had always kind of confused it with Iron Chef, which was a show I used to watch yeah. back in the day. Um, but I absolutely loved it. It was so entertaining. And you were so good. Like, I was really rooting for you against the brothers. Well, <laughs> Just I, because, like, sorry, go ahead. No, I was going to say, I feel like you kind of set the, you know, of course, I'm incredibly biased. But I actually think that even the hosts of the show would tell you that they feel like that season was probably the best season that, of Top Chef that we ever made. Because it had a realistic dynamic in it that hadn't been present to that point they made a pretty big shift prior to that season in how they cast the show and in in doing so what they did was they went out and they intentionally tried to cast people who they thought who they didn't know if they could beat each other they kind of went and said okay like we're gonna have tiers of contestants we're gonna have some people who are here because of their personality and we're gonna have some people who are here for this and then we're gonna have some folks that we're pulling together that we think are probably just going to be so competitive that we have no idea how this is going to work out. And they mixed us all together for the first time in season yeah. six and out came something that I think was very dynamic and very real. Yeah. I, I mean, there was obviously a sibling rivalry there, oh, yeah. which just created incredible inherent drama. But I mean, I think it was you, Michael and Brian who pretty, I mean, who dominated. I yeah. mean, you guys want, I think they said at the, in the finale, 12 out of the 13 elimination challenges. I think you would want five of them. Yeah. And I know yeah. you voted the fan favorite of the season. And it's weird because I have a question for both of you. And then I'll tailor it back towards Kevin. How much reality TV do you two watch? If any? I watch zero. Um, zero. Unless you unless you count like live sports as reality TV. Um, so, <laughs> but, Only if you believe it's scripted. If you believe yeah. the NBA is scripted, then sure. Sometimes I Sometimes I feel like the like ESPN in general is scripted. Um, but I I watch very, very little of that kind of television. I'm I literally I joke about this, but I'm like a man born several hundred years too late. Um, because I would much rather read a hardbound book about a war that took place 300 years ago than I would like watch television. So that's that's mm -hmm. I'm I'm old regardless of my actual physical age. Yeah. A 40-year-old trapped in a 250-year-old man's body. Yeah, so. exactly. Like, even as a little kid, my mom would say that, like, I, I didn't really have any interest in talking to children my age. I just wanted to, like, interview people's grandparents about their service time. Like, and so I, I don't know where this comes from. I'm not really sure, but it's just who I am. Learning about war at age five. Yeah, like, so what it. was it like serving in the Pacific? Yeah, like, weird question for a five-year-old to ask me, but here we go. You were, <laughs> you were on the front? You were on the front? <laughs> exactly. Yes, exactly. Blake, what about you? How much reality TV do you watch? You know, when you first asked the question, I was like, nothing other than Top Chef. Turns out that's not true. Massive Bachelor fan for a very long time, as I think if you've ever 
followed me on Instagram, you know, um, I was very big on American Idol back in the day. And I have fallen recently into Married at First Sight. And mm. um, I would like to give a shout out to what I think is actually the best reality TV cooking show of all time. And that's my friend Elon Hall's show, Knife Fight. Yeah, Knife Fight was a lot of fun. Oh, I've seen that mm-hmm. fight. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's a good one. Yeah. I asked this only because, so I, I watched uh, Top Chef Las Vegas. The reality TV show that I've seen by far the most is Survivor, the CBS show Survivor. And I've seen a little bit of Bachelor uh, stuff as well. What is so interesting to me, particularly about Top Chef, when it's a competition-based reality show, normally as a viewer, you are in line with the progress of an episode. In Survivor, it's an athletic challenge or an endurance challenge, and whoever wins is the person who who did it the best. And you see it as the viewer, the host sees it, the other contestant sees it. When it's a sports competition, you know, whoever does the best does the best. With a cooking competition show, it's really up to the taste of a very few specific people. And as the viewer, we can watch your plating, we can watch your preparation, we can hear you talk about it if you feel confident about what you made or not. But we really have no indication of how good the thing is, because ultimately it comes down to test. That's like the final barrier in anything that you cook. So what was that like for you, having gone through the experience, and then I don't know if you ended up watching the show after it all, but having gone through the experience of being in a competition show where it is ultimately up to three to five people to decide your fate, did you feel like there was an accurate portrayal of your work? Yes and no. So what I'll say is that, yes, it is incredibly subjective. And you kind of know that and almost, I almost think that like the chefs embrace that. It's it's like a crutch for when they don't like what you made. You can go, well, that's not because I didn't make something great. That's because they're weird. <laughs> or, you know, mm-hmm. like you can kind of use that as an excuse. Um, that said, I think that I was very quick to realize, oh, the path to winning isn't beating the other people here it's convincing the people tasting it that mine is the best. And so I would just, I didn't really concern myself with the challenges all that much. I would listen to the rules and go, okay, right. You want me to make this? And then I wouldn't try to dive too deep into the, like, what are they asking for? I would just try to make the most delicious thing I could make with the thought process being that you don't get sent home if it's delicious, period. Like that's it. You know, it's really hard to argue with delicious is what I would always tell people. And that doesn't mean you'll win always, but it certainly means you won't lose. And I think I took that approach a lot. And as it turned out, it did make me win more often than not, especially in quick fires. You know, I still hold the record for that because I have just a very particular methodology for how I approach doing it. Now, where it gets tough is when you get down to the end and you know that everybody there has made something excellent. It's not People don't really make mistakes at that level anymore. I, certainly in Top Chef All-Stars, which I filmed a number of years later, the very first challenge onward, people did not make mistakes. And so you were judging between great and great. And that's when it gets really hard to um, – it gets hard to settle yourself mentally on this idea of I might win or I might lose, and I have no way of of sort of knowing that. Usually your gut – early on can tell you like I know I did a great job but at some point you go like and I'm sure they did too and now we're just going to get down to a matter of whether or not they like the taste of pork better than they like the taste of chicken like and it's and then you're stuck and um that's always been hard and it's been really hard for me too because I I cook in a very very distinctive way um one of the greatest compliments ever paid to me by a food writer was that they could pick my food out of a lineup with their eyes closed because of the just the way I season food. It's a very aggressive, you know, I, I joke it has the subtlety of a sledgehammer. Um, and that's just my method. And um, at the end of the day, sometimes, especially when you're cooking, I find for European chefs, it's too much for them. And they might not skew your direction. Sometimes they prefer a softer touch that just, that's just not me. And if this was, if this is painting, you know, if this is visual art, it's the difference between do you want somebody who is small brushes, lots of tiny brush strokes, you know, doing tempera, or are you drawn to somebody who has an aggressive, you know, sort of command of their brushwork and it's it's big and it's bold and it's purposeful. And and I land in that second camp. 
did you pay any mind to the judge's taste at all as you went? Like, were not, you like, Tom really. likes his meat a little less cooked or anything like that? It, yes and no. I should I said not really. But in, in truth, I did know that there were some things that they were always kind of harping on. You would hear, you know, in TV, you would you don't hear every single comment they make. Right. As as you know, obviously it's chopped down. But when you're standing in the room, if the prevailing theory is that um, you know, we asked you to make tacos and no one made anything spicy, you start kind of you should at least log in there somewhere to go, okay, they think in their mind they're saying that if they if if we approach a dish where the ethnic cuisine tends to skew this direction, we need to pay attention to that. And so I would catalog little things like that. I knew that Tom's big sticking points were in traditional cookery methodology. So in other words, you could get a pass by being kind of avant-garde in your conceptualization. But if you said that I am going to sear a scallop, to him that has a definition that is very, it's very strict. It doesn't, it's not open for interpretation. And so what you needed to do more than anything was be careful how you sold it, what you told him it was. Because if you said seared scallop and it was blonde on the outside, he'd say that's not seared. And you'd go, well, I, lightly seared. And he'd go, that's not seared. You know, didn't matter if it was perfectly cooked. To him, you didn't do what you said you were going to do. So you had to right. you had to be careful with that. Padma is generally just a person who doesn't like um, food that gets too, like just too conceptual. She likes things to be fairly straightforward. Gail and the guest chefs are all over the place. Some of them are, are one way, some are the other, and you just never know, really. Since you brought up Gail, I did want to announce at some point on this show that my husband has the biggest crush on Gail, like <laughs> more than any other woman alive. And I might have a little crush on Gail too. Like, is she as lovely in real life oh, as yeah. she seems? It Much, much more so. In reality, I think everybody should have a crush on her. She's... She's a lovely person. She's very beautiful. Obviously, everybody can see that on television. But what they miss is that she is extremely warm. She is, you know, I feel like every time I do see a clip from the show and I see her like stern faced, I laugh because that is not Gail. Like she is just the the nicest and most welcoming person ever, almost a little like bubbly, you know, you might say. And so it, it to me, it's really hilarious having to watch her play like tough cop um because that's not what you get on set and if anything i would say that she was a lot better than the other judges at um talking to you on a very humanistic level and not making herself a judge really until she absolutely had to Love okay her. i guess i have a crush on her too yeah sure <laughs> you both convince me why not um blaine mentioned earlier that you would get nominated for these james beard awards and just kind of toss them mm. over your shoulder and she mentioned your cancer diagnosis. Yeah. Did that did that diagnosis play a role in how you felt about those awards? Did it take on less meaning for you? Was there more of a, an existential mindset behind winning something like that? Or do you think that's just you in general? It definitely has changed me. And it's still changing me. I should be clear that that this is a very slow burning candle, as best I can tell. Um, although I am now officially, like within the last few months, cancer free as of May twenty fifth of this year. Um, thank you. It's it's the process of going through it that is what changes you. It's not the being sick. It's the the life around. You know, first of all, I think it comes to terms with recognize your own your own mortality, especially if you're younger. You know, when I was diagnosed, I was 35 years old, which is very weird. Um, but it's the process of you become so ensconced in the community that you you watch people who you get close to die, and you watch people really struggle. You watch this really leveling experience that is tragic, where. Um, it, you know, like literally you'll be, you know, you're at the treatment center and you might see somebody who is, um, you know, dropped off in a car that is on its last leg. And then another person dropped off in a Rolls Royce, literally I've, I've witnessed this. And then within 10 minutes, they're in the same scrubs in the same wheelchair in the same room. And, and it's, it puts a lot of things into perspective for you. And so what it did for me was that it made me 
very much made me appreciate the path to wherever I am going um, and to be not nearly as fixated on the end, um, sort of the the end destination. I think I spent the early part of my career so obsessed with reaching a pinnacle or or like a, you know, climbing the mountain as it were, that I forgot that the climbing of the mountain is the point. In my mind, it was the standing on the top and staring down, only to realize that there is no top. And that is, it's a, it's a figment of your imagination. And if you're a driven person like me, there'll just be a series of tops and it'll, you'll never reach the, the real crest of it. And so I, I began to appreciate the effort that it took to climb the mountain in the first place. And I think I also started asking myself, do I care about the mountain? Do I care about the climbing of it? What exactly am I doing? Do I want these things? And so when I was last nominated for a Beard Award, which was uh, last year, um, and it was for you know Best Restaurant Tour in America, I took that one more seriously than any nomination that I have had to date. And I think that the reason behind that was not that I thought I would win. In fact, I was certain I wouldn't win um, because I saw who I was up against. And in my opinion, I didn't deserve it next to somebody else who I was up against. But I took that one very seriously. And it meant a lot to me because I thought that that was an award that recognized a journey, not simply being at your height right now, but that it took you decades to become a restaurateur, not a chef. And the effort that it takes to be great at that is the effort of treating people fairly, of, of, of building a business that is not sustainable, but a healthy business, something where people thrive both as the guests and as the people that are working inside it. There's a lot that goes into that. And so I, I it meant a lot to me. And I have to believe that had I gotten this recognition prior to going through my my cancer treatment, I don't know that I would have. In fact, I think part of me would have felt like, well, of course I should. You know, there would have been an arrogance to it that I just simply don't have any longer. And I know that is because what I learned, if I learned anything through this process, is that I, as a human being, am not motivated by money and i'm not motivated by awards and i'm not motivated by a, a, you know the plaques on the wall i seem to be motivated by this notion of doing something that is impactful beyond myself personally i want to do something that is helping other people positively and if that help is providing them a job okay or if that help is um you know guiding them mentoring them great like but it's just this notion that i don't seem to be very interested in doing anything professionally that isn't a little bit more worthwhile or deep. And so I have to think that maybe those earlier awards didn't resonate either because they were only, it was just awarding me for being me. And I, I didn't want that. I wanted to, I wanted to be recognized as someone who was doing more than just for me. I wanted, you know, if that makes any sense, I wanted it to be more meaningful than that. 100%. I think that's where a lot of people end up when they're on a journey like yours is you're good at something, obviously. You're very good at cooking, making food. And you reach a certain level of success and you think it will fulfill you. And then you realize ultimately like the, the only true fulfillment you can get in this world, in my opinion, is being there for other people or helping other people. That satisfaction of you knowing you made somebody else's day better is the best feeling in the world. And that's what, I mean, you said it anyway in your response, but that's what I was going to ask you is if that Beard Award in particular was so meaningful because it felt more like of a, a collaborative award for you as a restaurateur, it as did. opposed to just you as a chef in the kitchen. Yeah, it felt like an award that we were all winning together, but it also felt like, and you you said this and I wanted to to sort of key in on it, is that I've also recognized that the real reason that I like cooking for a living isn't that I like cooking, which I do very much. It's that I find it is the best way that I have come up with for me to be able to connect with people um, on a meaningful level when I would otherwise not be able to, because I am a very introverted person. I would never just go up and have a deep conversation with a stranger, but weirdly I can put a part of me on a plate and it become very self-expressive, hand that to them and watch their reaction. And that's my way of of having that moment. And so I think I enjoy it more for people 
eating it than I do for me making it. And maybe that's why the restaurateur award meant a little bit more to me. I want to um, talk, we talked about this on the last episode, I'm sure every episode going for I for it, I'll bring it up. But I'm obsessed with this concept of the more personal that you make something, the more universal it becomes. And what you have done specifically at Revival, I feel like not only is that, you know, great for you and the people who get to work there and whatever, but that is a gift to anyone who's ever had a grandmother, right? Or who has sat at a family table or anything like that. And what I loved about it is I, in my mind, I expected to go there and eat like my grandmother's mac and cheese or, you know, this thing that was my grandmother's. And it was not the same. Like my grandmother, incredible cook, from the South, but it, the fact that it was like your family stuff and so deeply personal into what you wanted those dishes to be actually provided like a much more profound experience of, of family and grandmother and community and all of, you know, those things that's a concept much bigger you're not going to meet someone on the street and be like, let's really talk about what like Sunday dinners meant to you. Right. But right. I, that also is so continuous between what Tom does with his films and what I do with my paintings. Like I'm trying to express something deeply personal that will then make you remember something deeply personal. And we sort of have that connection without ever needing to talk. Yeah. And, and I think that it is something that, you know, uh, for lack of a better way of saying it, it works like that way of thinking does in fact work. It's true. And I've witnessed it countless times in my career. I'll tell two brief stories. When I was writing my first cookbook, there is a recipe for just slow cooked green beans, braised pole beans, and, uh, you know, could not be a simpler recipe. And I have a professional recipe testing team that works alongside me. And I make it, they taste it, and then they try to replicate it using my instructions. And, and that recipe brought one of the recipe testers to tears. And, I, and I, I asked her what was wrong. And she said, I just like, I had a moment. I just, just for a brief moment, I was transported back to my grandmother's house and I, and I just miss her. You know, she's a woman that I miss. And this was that bite, like just did that to me. That is powerful. And that, and that stuck with me. And years later, the reason that the warm banana pudding is on the menu at gun show and that it never comes off the menu at gun show is that it's not because it's the best dish on the menu. In fact, it's probably the least technically proficient dish on it, but it is the most vulnerable. It's the one that tells a very candid and real story of my people and how I ended up in this place. And I want you to taste it because I don't think it matters whether your grandmother made that dish or not. I think that in tasting it, you will find yourself a lot closer to me on a personal level than you would have anticipated feeling going out to dinner somewhere to a restaurant. Absolutely. Kind of like that's, I was going to say kind of like that scene in Ratatouille where yeah. he makes Ratatouille for the critic and he transports yeah. back to being a little kid. Yeah. That's yeah, great. exactly. And I'm putting my favorite dessert by far. By yeah, that's way. mine too. Well, also, um, Tom was at my wedding. I demanded that we have banana pudding because it is, it is my favorite dip. I mean, my kids ask me once a week, what's your favorite food? Banana pudding. But mine was different. Mine was cold. Right. Like the lady who made it for me made it very, very differently. And like the difference in your banana pudding and my banana pudding is magical, right? That it can be like such a profound dish to so many people and there can be all the different variations and what's right for you or what your memories are like right. what a conversation exactly and it's not that one is right and the other is wrong i mean i went to a uh, an art show here in in maine a few weeks ago um where there's a series of of watercolor paintings that were painted the same subject painted by andrew wyeth and painted by edward hopper same buildings same boats same whatever the case may be and it's really interesting to look at them and see the similarities. You can recognize them for being the same subject, but the interpretation it has nothing to do with skill. It's not like one of them could paint better than the other. 
It's just how they choose to represent it, the way they saw it and the way they felt like they they should put it on, you know, onto this piece of canvas or on this piece of paper is interesting to me. And I think that that story of why is more important than the end product. You know, it's it's the understanding the why that I find so intriguing. Um, I think it's beautiful to look at both end products, but I'm a lot more interested in the how they came to that place than anything else. Absolutely. You know, it's another like fantastic vessel for that is chicken salad. I feel like in the <laughs> South, like people have these like deep, deep memories of chicken salad that just, oh, it tells you so much about who they are, like what region Whether of the South. Whether or not you use raisins, if you use celery yes, in it. Yeah. grapes, yeah. you know, lots of mayonnaise, whatever. Yeah, I feel that way with... um meatloaf like where it's like uh that's a that's a polarizing topic with people that's maybe of all the dishes that i've ever made professionally the one that i think people feel the most open to just telling you whether they like it or whether their mom made it that way or not like i mean those come at you on meatloaf it seems to have some very strong opinions on it i mean for sure that's my experiences like with meatloaf are, are negative so see would, yeah that's it i would it be like, one of those people and weirdly, the meatloaf recipe at Revival is the only recipe that we put on the opening menu that was not connected to my family in any way whatsoever. And the reason for it was that I concluded that that was a dish that we needed to start from scratch and make just the most delicious version we could make and divorce ourselves from the idea that like it must have green peppers or it must have ketchup or it must have this because we were never going to be right in the eyes of everybody. There were always going to be people who were like, you're an idiot. It's meatloaf. It's got to have X, Y, and Z. And so we just ditched that way of thinking and went back to a, a much more like rudimentary version and just said, let's make it really tasty. And then if they argue about it, they're still arguing from a position of, I loved yours, but you know. Yes. Just like I loved your banana pudding. Yeah. Yeah. It is it, like, and what a, what a great conversation. I also, as a restaurateur, don't want to not discuss what you it have done a gun show for other chefs like what an incredible way to reach down and say come up here with me to so many people and lift up other chefs and give them a platform like I I'd give you the award just for that what a non-selfish community building recognizing the talent of others and it what a you must have so much uh belief in yourself to be able to do like that's so the mark of being able to share the spotlight if you're you know yeah i appreciate that and i think that you know in reality gun show is a study in you know the old the old golden rule you know um because a lot of it was driven by the fact that you, in earlier points in my career when i had what i thought was a very good idea something that was you know, kind of a fully fleshed out idea that should be a plate of food that we were willing to put on the menu, that that opportunity wasn't given to me because I wasn't the chef. And because I hated this idea that we invalidate the opinions of people earlier in their creative process. I think that's a really bad way to mentor creative talent. I do not think that you should convince them that until we reach this point where it where everything is always fully baked that everything before that was um wasn't worthy of something i just think that's a really silly way to approach it and so for me that meant allowing younger not so much from age younger in their time in the career um folks to be able to craft something and put it on a menu alongside the dishes of the guy who owns the building and say look i i I'm putting this on the same marquee. We don't have a, this isn't a, a you know, um, we don't have a terrorist sort of thing here. We all stand on the same level. And to me, that does a couple of things. For one, I think that it it increases morale and, and, you know, just makes people a lot happier in the work. The second is that it has this amazing capacity to, um, it's like if it was coaching, it's coaching on steroids. Somehow people's skill set and talent will come to the surface infinitely faster under that circumstance. And the third is that I believe that if you are working on something and you are proud and connected to that thing you are working on, I just don't find that people make very many mistakes when that happens. It's a self-policing, for lack of a better way of describing it, kind of process. And so 
when you tell somebody, look, your idea, I like it and I'm going to let you run with it and I'm going to have you put it on here and we're going to put a dollar sign next to it and list a number and you're going to take it to the dining room and you're going to tell people about it yourself and you're going to make it clear that it's yours. That process alone weeds out the sort of, um, it weeds out bad ideas and, and it also more importantly really makes the person who's working on it feel invested in its success and it turns out to produce, you know, pretty much consistently great results. And, and, you know, as the chef, I love watching other people because I'm learning from them too, by the way, not just because they've been doing it less time than me is irrelevant, but also I'm proud as a business owner to be able to, um, to do something that is, you know, that in a lot of ways hadn't been done before. There's not really anything new under the sun, but this notion of sort of equality of ideas in a place like that is, is pretty, was pretty new when we did that. I, I have many, two points to that. Uh, real quick. How many restaurants <laughs> are that are similar in the United States currently? I mean, I don't know any, like I, okay. there might be some, but like, I just don't know any, like it is pretty normal for your sous chefs to have some degree of input, but to let your like guy who has just started in the industry the, in the last month have input i don't know anybody doing that incredible yeah i think that that kind of goes back to to the old paradox of a recent college graduate looking for an entry-level job and the job says you must have three plus years of experience and the idea the idea is like well how do i get that experience and they say like i don't know find a job that doesn't yeah have right that it, requirement you know exactly like how do you get started until you get started yeah. And, and, and I, you need somebody like that. Yeah. Right. And I'll admit there was a selfish angle to this as well. You know, I mean, it was not purely altruistic. The selfish angle was I wanted to make sure that if and when we wanted to open another restaurant or, or develop another concept or whatever the case may be, that we would have the caliber of talent available to us to do that next thing. And it's a heck of a lot easier to build them internally and, and, you know, have them in your depth chart, as it were, to use that sports analogy, than it is that every single time you need to make a play, you got to get on the phone and call somebody and try to find them out of the out of the ether, you know. And so for me, um, this felt like a very good way to do it. And the idea weirdly came about through competition in general. It it came about because of years of playing competitive sports and remembering how valuable getting game time reps were versus practice. And I thought to myself, man, there was just no substitute for like taking a snap in the game. It's just a different thing altogether. We can run the play a hundred times in a week. Doing it one time in the game seems to be more valuable. And that idea just stuck with me and said, well, I, you know, I can talk about like, we could have them played up a tester and do this and do that for, you know, every week. But if they put it on the menu, I have a feeling that that experience is going to be a heck of a lot more impactful than just practice reps. Yeah. And you're empowering people. You're yeah. empowering people to take control of their job, their profession, you know, which I think I, I can relate to that a little bit as a producer, because I have a lot of people that I hire. And I know many producers who can be total control freaks and kind of demand that every department on a film, you know, makeup, wardrobe, whatever, do things a, a particular way. And my style has always been like, I'm hiring you because you're good at this thing. I want your input. I want your your say so on how you think things should go because you do this particular aspect of a film shoot better than I do, and that's what I want to hear from is your side, you know. And like as a producer, you have what's called production assistants who are kind of like the grunts on any shoot. I'm sure you know that from your experience in TV. And um, I love kind of showing them how things are done as we're navigating a set because. I want them to be excited to be there. Like that that job in particular is a very thankless job. It's it's only really for people who really want to be making movies because you have to do a lot of shit. Like you're the first ones there. You're the last ones to leave. You're going on runs all the time. You're picking up extra food because somebody forgot a lunch. Like you're just doing all the crap that nobody really wants to do. And to me, it's like, if you're willing to do that job, then I know you really want to be here. And I want to make it as good of an experience as possible for you. So you want to keep coming back. And I think also selfishly to like what you were saying, there's kind of a, a loyalty that's born out of that. 
because they remember you're the person who gave them this insight or this opportunity or this empowerment, and they want to keep coming back to working with you. So you help lift others up, but in reality, you're also continuing climbing the stairs with them in a way, because you stay in touch with the generation after you. Right. You're hundred percent right. And that's it is that it's, you know, um, mentorship is a word I use a lot. And to me, mentorship um, implies a certain degree of um, humility on the per on the part of the person who's supposed to be teaching, you know, and, and it requires that. And if you're just, if you're coaching or teaching just from a position of power and authority, I feel like it's very hard to connect with the people who you're trying to to share that message with. I think if on the other hand, um, you're willing to put them a lot closer to your level, you know, the old adage, take them under your wing. I think that's what that's supposed to mean is that there's a certain connectivity there and it does foster trust and it fosters a sense of ownership in the product that that we're working on, whether that be a dish or a movie or a piece of art or a table that we're building, or it doesn't really matter. It's just this notion of the, I'm careful that I never, ever say someone who works for me. I always say someone who works with us, like, you know, because, and that's not like I've had to practice that. That's the difference between where I view myself and where I view everybody else. I don't think of them as just purely subordinate to my vision. I see them as part and parcel to my vision being able to be, re like, come to reality. Yeah, that's great. I mean, so this podcast, the idea behind this podcast was potential creative burnout that a creative person who turns their passion into a career may deal with. How have you dealt with that, if at all? It seems like from what I've heard from you today and on your season of Top Chef that I watched, that if it was the last day on Earth, if the moon was about to collide with Earth and we were going to all disappear, you would spend that last day cooking a meal for your family like I, that's just the vibe yeah. i get from you I, I think you genuinely seem to just love it for the sake of loving it but how have you dealt with burnout in the past if yeah that's no it's it's very it's a been a very real thing for me um you're right that like the passion for the food has never dwindled and i don't think it ever will dwindle to be honest with you i think that is part of my makeup and i love it i have become very burned out on the business of making food for a profit, like for the idea of crafting something that is meaning, both meaningful to me and advantageous to the bottom line. That has exhausted me many times over in my career. And I've dealt with it in a lot of different ways, some healthy and some not, to be candid with you. Um, you know, some versions of it have been to utilize my financial success and you know, enjoy the spoils as it were. It turns out that's not been very fulfilling for me ever. Um, I've tried that method and it just doesn't work. Um, I've tried to combat burnout by stepping away from work. I, you know, I went on a sabbatical a few years ago. Uh, that didn't really work, to be honest with you. And I think it was because I, in that scenario, I was convinced that the work was what was burning me out. And I don't think it's the work because it turns out that I really like working. And so the hard work is not the problem. Where I have landed now and the way that I combat it at this point is that I have learned the elements of my business that trigger burnout for me personally, and I have found people inside my organization who thrive in those elements, and I have given them the opportunity to take care of that side of it, and I don't do it anymore. I just compensate them and give them the authority to handle these things. And then it comes with the hard trade-off because that sounds really easy to people go like, yes, yeah, so you just delegated it off. I delegate off the responsibility and I also defer the credit for the work that they're doing back to them. So I don't own their successes either. I embrace allowing them to do it. And it has allowed me to stay inside the lane that keeps me very healthy mentally. And, um, and it's also, frankly, given other people opportunity to do the things that they thrive in because I have, you know, I have a sous chef that is not uber creative, to be honest with you. And he'll be the first to admit that he's not super creative, but he loves, he, he genuinely loves the idea of everything being hyper organized, of knowing down to the ounce how much of something we have in the restaurant. I cannot be bothered by things like that. That is not my brain at all. Um, I, I'm just not that way. Some days I wish I could be terrible. He loves it. And so in empowering him to embrace that side of him, 
and then trusting him, I let him be my boss in those areas. And, and, and I am, you know, I am subject to his authority in those areas. And that has proven to be a very, very healthy relationship for the two of us, because we are leading in the ways that we are respectively very talented at. And, and, and so that has helped a lot. And then the final thing I would say is that I found for me personally, that a singular creative outlet was becoming very unhealthy. And that if I, because then there was this demand that I be perfectly creative in that area and only that area all the time. And what I have realized is that my creative energy has always manifested itself in a lot of different ways. And when I was younger and none of them were my job, I could lean into all of them. I could embrace all of them. That made me a renaissance man, whatever you want to call it. Like, <laughs> But the older I got, the more it felt like the world demanded that I pick one and only one. And, and you know, the social media comment version of that is like stick to blah, blah, blah. I have reached the point where I have completely bucked that idea. And I am very vocal about that, that I am thrilled that the thing I am most talented at from a creative standpoint seems to be food, but I'm still going to paint my paintings and I'm still going to do my drawings and I'm still going to mess with music and I'm still going to write. And I don't care that I'd be great at all of those things, but when the calling from the inside is paint it instead of plate it, I'm going to lean into that because I think that what's more important is that you constantly foster creativity, not that you demand it only exist in a singular form. Absolutely. One of the I mean, most know, beautiful things I've ever heard. I mean, you put that so succinctly. So much yeah. truth in what you just said. I know you and Blaine mentioned at the beginning of the podcast that you were out taking photos. Is photography a big passion for you? Or is that something that's kind of newer? It's a it's somewhat newer for me. Um I I love I love photography, but I also um and to be candid, I'm just so low tech as a human being. I'm such a Luddite that um, a modern camera to me, like I have, you know, I film my own videos and stuff. And in doing so, you know, it takes me six to eight times as long as a normal human being, because I just am like, what is this button? Um, and so I oh, find, play. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So I find that like simple is better for me. And so I found a rhythm. I found also, and I think maybe this is the difference. I figured out what I like looking at and I figured out what images mean something to me. It takes a long time. I think I have watched chefs in my career. Um, we refer to it as finding your voice. That's kind of the term that we use. It's not unique to food, but, but when we're saying that about another chef, we mean that they have finally found their ability to convey themselves in a, in a very authentic and unique way. And I have watched chefs my whole career search and search and search and search and search and never find their voice. And, and for years, I think I misconstrued that as a lack of talent. Now, I think as I am older, I recognize that sometimes there's too much pressure to find your voice. And sometimes the best way to find it is by process of elimination. And so it's to dabble and in the dabbling to go, ah, you know what, honestly, that does, I'm not even into that. And then just start carving it down until you land on something that you really love. And so that's how photography has worked for me. I started wanting to take the best photo of everything and then realized, nah, that's not really, that's never going to happen. So let me see if I can't get really good at a type of photo. And, and that's what I, that's what I've done. I would say I did the same thing cooking. I realized pretty early on that I wasn't going to be great at every style of food or at every technique. So I found the ones that were the most engaging to me that I got most excited about. And then I gave them all of that energy, you know, rather than, than, you know, trying to be pretty good at a lot of stuff. I'm really good at like six things. So that's it. Although I will say your, to go back to Top Chef, your bacon chocolate banana dessert yeah. looked incredible. <laughs> I, know, I, I know in that episode you're like i don't really do desserts i don't know how i'm gonna do this but man i wanted to eat that thing so oh it's so funny that i say that because you know i always say that like i don't really do desserts which is like it's just a lie i don't even know why i say it out loud i started my <laughs> career as a pastry chef so i don't know why i say that <laughs> um maybe i mean that i don't really do them that much any longer but it's it's a total farce i don't know where like why the first time i said that i heard it and was like that's not true and then i just kept going with it so um yeah <laughs> You're expose. giving yourself an out. Yeah, yeah expose <laughs> here. Like that is just not true at all. And in fact, like 
I'm regularly making desserts at home. And help, even when I do like dinners and they're like, hey, we can have our pastry chef do something. I'm like, no, it's all fine. I, I can make my own desserts. So I don't, I don't know where this is coming from. <laughs> In the interview I was listening to earlier today, you were talking about your mastery of the molten chocolate cake. Oh yeah, the molten chocolate cake. That was like, yeah. you know, teenage me not being as good looking as other kids. I was like, what's my in here with the ladies? And then I was like, I can cook a lot better than my classmates can. And I'm going to dial in something that every teenage girl seems to love, the molten chocolate cake. And it sure. it worked wonders. So. <laughs> so funny that you say that, because when I was in high school, I started to learn guitar and I'm self-taught on guitar. I'm not amazing at it or anything, but I can play. And before I could play a G chord, I learned the entirety of Blackbird by the Beatles. There you go. I could play that like finger style front to back before I could play a single chord purely to impress girls. Yes. Yeah, purely course, for that. Like Whatever I would play it and they would be like, oh my God, that's incredible. What else can you play? And I'd be like, well, let's move on. Let's yeah, yeah, on waves. A hundred percent. Yeah, exactly. I poured all my energy into this and then it was like, can you make a peanut butter version? And I'm like, what else can, let's go to a movie. Um, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> I'm allergic to peanut butter, so yeah, I'm exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh man, that's really funny. Going back to finding your voice, I do think, as someone who it took uh, a very long time to find a voice, and I actually had to find a voice in the thing that I don't think I'm the best at. But I have found that once you go through the process of finding your voice, owning that it's your voice, embracing that it is much easier to do it in other creative aspects, right? You can yeah. length, shorten that time to six months versus it took me almost 20 years to do it the first time. And now I'm like, I, I got it. I yep. know what I am. Yep. I think, I think it's because you learn the uh, nonverbal cues that go on inside your body. You know, the, the reactions, some, you know, what do you call it? Like trusting your gut. It, you start to be a lot more aware of them, you know, um, and so it, it's just easier to guide yourself to it. You know, I also think there's a tremendous amount of confidence that comes from cracking that egg the first time and going, okay, it's not impossible. And, you know, and then it, it just, it gives you a, um, a boost of energy that you sometimes need to, to get over that hump, which is that hump, by the way, I think is mostly just fear. I think it's mostly just us being scared of 100% of, of making something that we think other people will, will not like, or will mock or, or whatever the case may be. Yeah, we talk about this in our previous episode, Blaine and I, that um, I think as soon as you start to do something creative where you are not really concerned about the audience is when your creativity can take off. Because for me as a, as a writer, uh, and I mentioned this last week, uh, all I wanted to do is just rip off the best movies that I had seen, right? And like they weren't even necessarily my style. They were movies I liked, but not necessarily what I wanted to make. And I was doing that, and every time I would I would read back and be like, "Yeah, this is okay, but it's just a knockoff of the thing I was admiring," which is exactly what it was supposed to be. Like that was right. the goal. Right. So in a weird way, I succeeded in making like a B level version of that thing, but it took a while to realize, like, okay, what what are the things that interest me? What do I want to write about? And just right. trusting that instinct and knowing you'll find your audience because if you're interested in something, there is someone else out there who is interested in those things too. Right. And and what you learn in time is that it would have been better for you to ask yourself, what is it about these movies that you love? Like, why do you love them? What about them do you love? Not like, and not in broad brush strokes, like drill down. What do you love? And, yeah. and, if, and once you get to that place where you can answer that question clearly, you can also then start to create with, a, with a, a lot greater purpose. People, cooks do this. This is actually, in fact, part of the process of getting good at cooking is that inevitably you start by making somebody else's stuff and you practice being able to replicate somebody else's. Um, and that's okay. But there comes a time when you need to start doing it the way that sort of you are led to do it and be way less concerned. You know, it's like, I love Thomas Keller's books and I find them incredibly inspiring. The French Laundry is one of the most pivotal and important books in my career. And for a long time, I think I tried to cook things out of it and they were always just kind of like not as good a take as his. Now I look at that book and I know what drew me to it. I understand why it inspires me, 
And I let that energy flow and out comes something that probably to some people isn't recognizable as being influenced by this. But I know it is. And I also know that it's very real to me. It's very honest. Absolutely. Yeah. I do that. I am not a cook. I am not in any way trained, but I do have a very strong opinion of like what I think tastes good. And it has served me very well. Like I cook for people. People love the food. It's, you know, great. I have no one to impress anymore. And now that I'm 40, I just consider recipes like an inspiration. I'm like, yeah, we'll see. We'll see what you got here. And then yeah. I'm going to like just freestyle. Oh, yeah. no. Right. I'm, I'm with that. I tell everybody when I, when I do dinners from my books, and I'm like, the minute you buy this book, that recipe is yours and not mine anymore. So do with it, whatever you wish, like, you know, inevitably cook to your tastes and you'll be way happier than just following my recipe. Like you should take these as inspiration. Maybe you wouldn't, maybe you make one component. Maybe you don't even make the dish, but you just like the idea behind it. That's fine. Like, you know, um, I think that's probably why I pour so much energy into the writing side of the book too. So that I'm like, Hey, you don't need to cook anything. Just read the book. It's fun. Um, yes. But, but I, I don't have any issue with that whatsoever. You know, I, I, you know, to use, I use visual art as like a reference point a lot of the time, but, you know, I can look at paintings and artists, you know, who I love and I can tell you what it is that I love about them. Um, but I don't have any desire to try to like paint by numbers, my version of that, of that guy's work like that, that, that does nothing for me, but I do like finding an element and being inspired by it even if the end result I make isn't particularly identifiable as the thing that it started as. I'm okay with that. I love that reference. I have, a, it's almost laughable, but I have a very strong connection to Thomas Kincaid paintings. Mm -hmm. You know them. They yep. are everywhere. Um, and I don't want to paint like Thomas Kincaid. Like doing that minute detail would make me vomit. I can't be that detailed. I don't want it. I have no idea. But the thing that I love about them is the nostalgia. And therefore, I can appreciate, you know, what he does from a nostalgia level. And then all of my art is based on nostalgia. So it is like I find a little a little connection there, even though I could say, honestly, like if I had an original Thomas Kincaid, would I want to hang that in my house? And I'm like, it wouldn't fit, wouldn't fit the vibe or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> Sell it and get a bigger house. That's what you should do. Sure, sure. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> or you could you could try to to paint like Kincaid, vomit all over the canvas, and then you become famous as the vomit painter. Yeah. Oh well, I mean these are, these are great ideas. <laughs> uh, Kevin, Kevin, you mentioned your book and that you put so much effort into the writing, and it makes me really want to read it because I am not a chef at all. I can make eggs. I can make peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. That's kind of the extent of it. I can make chicken. Okay, but uh, one of my favorite books is Counterintelligence by Jonathan Gold. Mm -hmm. um which i love so much because it's uh you know he reviews a bunch of different la establishments i think the book's like 25 years old so probably a lot of them are gone now but so much of it just becomes a character study on the city of los angeles and the different like ethnic groups and the diverse population and the little sections little neighborhoods that really bring to life through the food he's eating the city itself and I think that's such a wonderful idea of understanding people and character and relationships and families and communities through the act of eating and like putting their their heart and soul into what they make to share with others. Like, I just think that's such a noble um, concept. And one, one, one question I have, which is kind of a, an aside, but as a self-professed non-chef, what do you feel, if anything, how do you feel about companies like Blue Apron that send these packaged meals with step-by-step -step guides to cook like individual platters for people living alone? Do you have any yeah. opinion on those types of businesses? Yeah, I love them. And for a reason that I think most people are going to find surprising. Um, I don't love them because I think you end up with great food. I, I don't think you end up with great food. I love them because for it, it's sort of a two pronged approach to the same problem that I see us having, which is the devaluation of food. And I find that a blue apron will get you in the kitchen and will make you do something for yourself. It'll make you actually go through the process of cooking. And in doing that, 
you will find an appreciation for the efforts made by people who do it professionally that I don't think you would have otherwise. I think I find that people who are better cooks are better diners. Almost across the board, everybody think it's, thinks it's the opposite, that the person who's a really good cook at home would come inside and, and in your restaurant and, and you know nitpick everything. Nope. They come in and go, man, that was a lot of work. Like, And they know it and they feel it. And then I think the second reason is that I find that the process of cooking for yourself and for someone else even more specifically is one of the most uniquely humanistic things that you can possibly do. You know, we as humans, as animals, are the only species that chooses willingly to manipulate our food before consumption. And so cooking I, is human. It's as human as anything can possibly be. And so I want people to do more of it because I am convinced that by leaning harder into what we are biologically, we'll be better people. I think that the process of cooking for ourselves and for others will inevitably make us better people. It makes us appreciate an element of ourselves that is often forgotten in this world that we live in where we don't have to do it anymore. Yeah. I say that as someone who had a Blue, Man, Blue Apron subscription for about two years. <laughs> and I, I did it because I was an adult in my 30s who had no idea how to cook anything. Right. And I thought like, well, that'll that'll teach me. And what you're saying is exactly true. I mean, they would have the little cardboard menus with the cooking instructions and the length of time it will take to prepare and to cook and to plate. And it would take me three times as long to do any of those things. Right. And, and like, it would be like, oh, this is going to be 25 to 30 minute process. And an hour and a half later, I'm like wiping sweat off my face being like, <laughs> okay, I can finally eat this like four ounce piece of salmon. This is incredible. But it, it does. It totally, it totally, like I, I inherently knew, I, I think intellectually understood the amount of work that goes on in the kitchen. But right. going through that process almost every day for a year and a half, it's exhausting. It yeah. really is. It's mentally and physically taxing because it requires so much concentration, uh, so much attention to detail, so much care. Like you have to have a really soft touch to accomplish it well. And I think, um, yeah, I, I really admire anyone who can cook a good meal because to your point, I think it is one of the most, one of the oldest forms of expression that we have right right and so so to be able to do that and to do it well and to put like your love into something it, it really translates in a beautiful way yeah yeah another great thing about blue apron we have garnish and gather in atlanta and i'm a big big fan and i did it for a little while and there was a jambalaya recipe and jambalaya is not something that i ever would think that i'd wanted to do i just thought it was complicated you know not really in my wheelhouse and the jambalaya recipe came and it had um do south pickles in it the drunken tomatoes yep. which i loved and we made the jambalaya and then my family liked it so much they kept asking for it. And now like it's Saturday afternoon, the dogs are playing, my friends call ahead of time. They're like, you making that jambalaya? So now it's like a community lovely thing that I never would have, I never would have known. Yeah, exactly. It's a, it's a, it's a very disarming way to, um, to learn about yourself and to learn about other people. You know, that's, I, I say that a lot about the deep South in general, that I don't think we're the most welcoming place in the world from a cultural standpoint, but I think that we've been weirdly welcoming of other people's culinary cultures. And it's one of the things I love best about Southern food is that like, we may not embrace you and your language, but we've embraced your food. And that's a step in the right direction. Like we got to do a lot of other work, but at least we're working towards it. So. Well, Kevin, this is this has been wonderful. And I've I've actually met you a couple of times just in random places and I really fangirled. And I mean, those are very, very memorable kind of like oh, I saw Kevin. Um, you are warmer than like I could and I thought I was like, I really, really like that person just from you know, two second interactions. And I am overwhelmed with how warm and genuine you and soulful you have been and thoughtful, all the things. Um, and it is very, as and someone, handsome. absolutely. You guys are, you're pouring it on thick. Absolutely. It's too much. Like I'm, I'm, I, I'm just going to act like I'm sunburned, not blushing. So. <laughs> 
Well, as someone who has reached the career heights that you have and battled the health things that you have and been such an icon in Atlanta and raised other people up with them, like honestly, life well lived, like career well done. And what a incredible thing you have built for the city of Atlanta. And as someone who wants to give back, I mean, you have done that a hundredfold for, I mean, for me, for, for the city, for the community. The first time I met you was just at the Peachtree Road Farmer's Market. And you're like at the top of your career out there doing a cooking demonstration. Like just, I'm so uh, impressed and grateful to have gotten to know you on this podcast. You guys are very sweet. Thank you so much. And it's been a real pleasure to to chat about these things because to me, you know, the next phase of my career I've I've realized is really um, that I have reached that point where I do know what my voice is and I have a confidence and a willingness to share it. And so a lot of that conversation isn't about the technique of cooking this or that. It's really about the conversations that in my mind all kind of orbit around one another when it comes to the the bigger picture of the why. And so I love having these deeper conversations and, and recognizing, by the way, that creativity is something that I believe is inside every single person. I t- I've, you know, I've been asked to speak to big businesses about, you know, fostering creativity. And the first thing I tell them is that everybody has it. And that that includes all these people in this room of accountants who think that they're not creative. You you are but you're you're forgetting that creativity manifests itself in a lot of different ways. And I think that being able to talk about that is really empowering because it helps people feel alive. I think that what we call creativity is this very like realistic energy inside all of us. And if it's given a place to sort of spread out into the world, I think we live a lot happier lives that way. And and I know for one that if that I want to live a happier one and I want other people around me to do the same. And so I embrace it and I love talking about it. It's ups, it's downs, it's challenges, and it's just the realities that surround it. Absolutely. And I I find that the more creatively energized I am, just the happier right. I am. Right. Like I'm just I'm beaming if I'm feeling super inspired. And I do feel like this podcast and having those conversations of, of how to get from creative inspiration to creative inspiration to creative inspiration just leads to a happier life. Exactly. It absolutely does. I can't believe you're our first guest (laughs) and that you embrace the concept and spoke to it so beautifully. Well, thank you very much. And I, and I, and you know, I'll leave you on this one note that I, I try to stress to people is that, Um, especially when you're talking about combating burnout, is that never get it in your head that when you reach the end of of an idea, that that's your last idea. Like it, it, it scares people to death when they hit these moments where they quote, can't come up with something else. And the pressure that they place on themselves for coming up with the next idea is what's standing in the way of the next one coming. I'm convinced of it. And so if every time you reach the end of a dark tunnel, Um, you think like, well, there's nowhere else to go. Like if you just stop for a second, I think you'll realize that, that, that there is more there. Um, and don't let it, don't let it get you down. Like don't get in your head that maybe, uh, you're used up. You know, I think that happens to a lot of creative people, um, that they think, well, flash in the pan. I had it for a little while. The inspiration's gone. Like it doesn't, it doesn't work like a a light switch for, at least for me, it doesn't. Um, or it looks, it works like a light switch in the middle of a thunderstorm where sometimes the power is on and sometimes it's off, but inevitably it'll come back on if we just wait a little bit longer. So. Yeah. And Blaine said this last week, when the, when the muse finds you, let it find you working, which yeah. I think is also very true, right? It's like, um, we, we discussed briefly, you know, the idea of a person who isn't known yet or hasn't established themselves and has a career or a lifetime to really refine their initial idea or presentation to the world as an artist. And then their next idea, the time they have to work on it is anything post that first idea that got them a lot of acclaim or a lot of attention. And then you reach this freak out stage where you think like, well, I'm never going to think of anything as good as that thing that I had 25 years in, in solitude or in anonymity to fine tune. And I think a lot of that goes into the thought of just don't be precious with your ideas. A lot of working out a creative lifestyle is to 
throw shit at the wall and see what sticks. Yep. And just yep. trust your gut, you know, and you'll find exactly. it that way. Exactly. Yeah. Thank you so much, Kevin. This Thanks, was such guys. a delight to talk to you. Yeah, Wonderful. I appreciate it. I hope y'all have a great day. You too. Likewise. Take care. See you later. Take care. Bye. 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 All right, guys. Well, thanks for sticking around to the end. That was incredible. I know that Tom and I are both feeling very grateful for Kevin's time and mm -hmm. everything that he shared with us. I consider it magical. Tom, what do you think? I thought he was absolutely a lovely gentleman. And as we mentioned in the beginning of the episode, I want to be his friend. Oh, he seems like such a warm guy. I feel like we would really get along. He mentioned sports. I want him to just invite me to his house and watch a, a football game together. Like that's In this goal dream, now. does he make you appetizers? Yes. In the dream, he makes me the chicken skin dish he made for his mom uh -huh. in Top Chef. Mm -hmm. And then, the, I mean, the banana pudding he mentioned at the restaurant. Like, yeah, that's kind of all that's been on my mind since he brought it up. What if he just like on the fly made you like a, a potato skin? I mean, oh, that, that'd be so good. <laughs> What's well, better than a potato? But skin. I also like I wouldn't I wouldn't I wouldn't ask for that because I don't want to feel like he has to. Yeah. But if he wants to. Great. Great. I'm certainly not going to say no to that, you know, <laughs> but if he also says like, hey, pick up Buffalo Wild Wings on your way, I'll be like, mm, OK. OK. Yeah. You know, yeah. beggars can't be choosers, but yeah. I know you could make this better, you know. <laughs> Do your job, Kevin. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> I would even root for the Falcons if that's what oh. you want. Okay. Yeah. You know? Dirty birds. Yeah, just totally suck up whatever yeah. I gotta do to get yeah. the invite. Yeah. All right. When you come to my house, you root for the dogs. Uh Georgia Bulldogs. Yeah. You've rooted for um, the dogs before for me. And so I have. you set a precedent. Yeah, that's true. I have. And I have no college football allegiance. Boston is not a big college football town at all. So there's really I nothing think, there. I feel like Kevin likes the dogs, but I don't want to just, I just like think that that's true, but I can't. I mean, he's, he lives in Georgia, so yeah. it's at minimum 50-50. Yeah, of course. Like who doesn't? Unless you went to like, I don't know. Georgia Tech, then you don't. But Macon you went University. to MIT, so. Well, he didn't go to MIT. He dropped out to pursue okay. to pursue a cooking career. Oh, good lord! Here's the bio guy. Uh, yeah. We have we have some thanks. Uh, we want to say thank you to Cliff Bond for the wonderful intro and outro theme music. Thank you, Cliff. Uh, I want to say thank you to Lincoln for producing this episode. We appreciate you. Great job. Thank you, Lincoln. All right, guys. Well, thanks for listening. We'll see you next week. Please look in the show notes and give us a five-star review. Write us a nice smiley face or a heart. You don't have to. On Apple Podcasts, it doesn't matter. A, an emoji is fine. You want to do the thumbs up, you know, whatever you want to do. And then please go to the YouTube link, subscribe to our YouTube channel. And I think that's all I'm going to ask you for this time, but we would appreciate it. There will be more in the future though. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. This yeah. is going to be off a, the hook shared, a shared burden. Yeah. That's just phase one guys. Yeah. If you cool. pass this level. We'll, we'll move you on to the next round. <laughs> We're doing an audience call. So if you if you rate and subscribe, you can continue listening. If not, you got to go. Locked. All right, guys. I don't mean that at all. Keep listening. Thank you so much. <laughs>